so you can reap it on today. What have you sown so you can reap it on today? The songwriter says you want to reap what you have already sown. What have you sown today? I thank God that we know how to sow love. We know how to sow peace. We know how to sow joy. We know how to sow happiness. God is expecting us his children to do the right thing so that others can see our light shine continuously. You don't have to boast and brag what God has done for you. God shows up and shows out on your behalf, and it continuously illuminates on you. And they say, hey, something's different about you. Something's different about you. And then they realize it's the God in you that's overflowing, that light continuously shining. You don't have to advertise it. God's already showing up on your behalf, maybe from before you get in the door. Even before you get in the door, people are saying, hey, I need something today. When you show up, they realize you are just what they need. I always tell you it's not about you. God is expecting you to do what you need to do so others can get delivered, so others can be set free, so others can see the love, joy, peace, and happiness that only God can give you. God is a God of peace, love, joy, and happiness, and we need to let the world know that, hey, you got to serve this God if you want what I got, and even better. You want what God has for you? Seek out. Search for him. Read his word. Apply the word to your life. Don't just be a reader of his word, but be a doer of his word. God is in the blessing business, and he won't fail you. Sometimes it don't happen right when you need it to happen. Sometimes it don't happen the way you think it should happen. But guess what? God is still in control. God is the one that delivers, sets free. And he is the one that can help you. I can pray for you all day long, and I believe that God is going to heal, deliver, and set free. You also have to believe it, too. You have to have the faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 and 1. You got to believe this word. God won't fail you. I, I encourage you on today to turn with me to Romans 15 and 13. And I'm encouraging you today as you read his word, believe his word. Believe his word. Romans 15 and 13 says, now the God of hope, God of hope. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy. We need joy. You wonder how some people can have all the money in the world, but they still don't have joy. They still don't have peace. God is missing. God is missing. When the joy is not there, God is missing. And peace. And you got to have the peace. You can't even sleep at night. You know why? Because you don't have that peace. Who gives you that peace? God gives you that peace. They always uh, crack on me and my family. They always joke on, about me because I can go to sleep standing up. And it, it is no joke. Pastor, have I ever gone to sleep standing up? I can go to sleep standing up. Been like that since I was a teenager, since I can remember. I can go to sleep. I got peace. Somebody can get on my last nerve at work, driving down the highway, in the grocery store, wherever I may be. Somebody can get on my last nerve. But by the time, the end of the day, I've only had a moment with that situation. By the end of the day, I'm at peace. I'm going to sleep. You are not taking my peace, love, joy, and happiness from me. You don't have that much power. And it's nothing but the devil trying to take that from you. Don't let the devil ever take your peace, love, joy, and happiness that God has given to you. 
God has given you this. This is a gift from God. You know, when you say, I'm blessed when I come, I'm blessed when I go, I'm blessed and I'm highly favored, that's because you got that love, that joy, that peace, that happiness that only God can give you. Those are gifts that God gives you. You need to be thankful for these gifts that God has given you. Let folks know, hey, I look like this because, I act like this because, I sound like this because, I got blessings from God. I got the love. I got the joy. I got the peace. I got the happiness that only God can give me. I thank God for you on today. And as I continue to read Romans 15 and 13, it says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy, not some, all joy and peace, all peace, all peace in believing. Now you got to believe. You got to believe that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. When Jesus left this earth, Whether you believe it or not, Jesus did leave this earth. He rose on the third day. He left this earth. He is now sitting up in heaven with our Father on his right hand, and he left us with the Holy Ghost so we wouldn't be comfortless. He's given us a comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost says, hey, don't do that. The Holy Ghost says, hey, don't go that way. And you might say, oh, something told me, or I think, or I thought, or my mind said. That was the Holy Ghost that's down on the inside of you saying, hey, let me help you out. Hey, precaution. Hey, red light, red light, red light. Don't go that way. Let the Holy Ghost guide you. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. I thank God for you on today. I thank God that you desire to fellowship with Top of the Mountain Christian Ministries. I thank God that we are yet still in the land of living. Why do I always say that? Because we could be somewhere else. We could be without our freedom. We, should, we could be shackled down behind bars. We could be in our grave, but we are yet still alive. God still has a plan and a purpose for you. That's why you're still here. Even though you go through, God says there's still a plan and a purpose, and I got greater for you. What have you reaped? What have you sown so you can reap what you've already sown? God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. But guess God? Guess what? God loves you even the most. And I thank God as Pastor Campbell comes forward and bring the word, you're going to hear something that you need on today. So apply it to your life. Get a paper, get a pen, and get to writing because God has got something just for you so that you can get your deliverance on today. Amen. 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 know how we do it here. Take out those cell phones. How's everybody doing this morning? Blessed. All right, all right. So how we, what do we do with the cell phones, ladies and gentlemen? What do we do with them? We just take them from you and let them know that it's just for them. All right, take it out. Text somebody. <laughs> Let them know that you're in service at Top of the Mountain Christian Ministry. Not only in service, if they're on Facebook, invite them. Amen. Invite them out to uh, our Facebook Live service and let them see what, what God is doing here in this service, what God is doing in your life, and, and see if they get a word from God as well. Hey Amen. Tell them, I'm in Top of the Mountain Christian Ministry, and we're praying with you and for you. In our Facebook Live, go ahead and hit like. And share, please like and share our messages amen. where God can go ahead and do that thing. Hey, man, hey, man, I'm excited. I'm excited. I thought Pastor Wendy was going to go ahead and go into my scriptures when she said Romans. <laughs> and how will be coming from Romans, too? <laughs> I sure enough will. Let them know it. Everybody text somebody. Amen. 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 So, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you right now, Lord God. As we send out these text messages, Lord God, we ask that we, it, these words that's on these texts touch somebody, Lord God. Touch them where they need to be felt by you, Lord God, and that where they need to be waken up by you, Lord God, and let them know that there are people that's thinking about them, Lord God. The ones that are in that moment, the one that wanted to commit suicide, the one that, that wanted to abandon his family, the one that wanted to walk away from their children, uh, let them know that we're thinking about them and we're praying with them and, and that this text message will hit them where they need to be hit, Lord. 
that it, they will be recovered and that they will be found, Lord God, as, as the word, the lost will be found, Lord God. The remnant will return, Lord. We thank you for the technology that you have given us, Lord God. We was not always a fan of it, but God, I thank you for it now because it has enlarged our territory, Lord God. It has given us an opportunity to reach out to those that we may not have any other opportunity to reach out to, Lord. We thank you for the love, the admiration that's shared one to another, Lord God. Now, Heavenly Father, as we go deeper into this word, Lord, I pray that you touch me and decrease me, Lord God, and, and forevermore increase you in me, Lord. And let the words that come out of my mouth not be my words, but the words that you place inside from the throne room of heaven, Lord God. And we thank you, and we praise you, and we glorify your holy name. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And thank you, Lord God. I want to come to you today. I want to talk about a subject, and I want to take my time, as I always do. At some moment, I'm going to teach to you. At other moments, I'm going to preach to you. But I want to talk about a war that's inside of us. A battle that's with inside of us. A hard time that, that we face, that we, that we always are constantly at war. You know, it, it said that this is peacetime right now, but it's not. I'm here to tell you that each and every one of us at some point in our life or at some point of our day are going through a war. We're, we're battling. And guess what? The, the biggest enemy that you have that's within inside of you is you. You find yourself fighting you all the time, and that enemy it wants to stay inside of you, but you got to have enough wherewithal and enough confidence in God that you are more than a conqueror and that you are victorious and that you can defeat this enemy that's with inside of you. It, your body wants to war against your body. Yeah, I know it might seem like it's crazy. It might seem like it's schizophrenic, but that's what takes place. It, when, I, when I talked about this, when I, when I got this word, you know, the first thing that God showed me, and I, I preached about it, uh, something like this before, but you know about, um, what's his name, uh, Hef, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You, if you understand anything about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was the same, same person. He was one and the same. He just had a battle with inside, so he took a potion that would bring out the other side. And if you understand what I'm saying, a lot of people that, that have issues, they, they take outside stimuli to bring out the person that's with inside of them. And, you know, that's, we call this in the police world, when somebody want to buffer up against you, they took a can of courage. It, they had to take something that, that will bring out that alter ego that's within inside of themselves. And that's what will happen with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He had an alter ego. He, he, he was a professor, and he was very smart. But he made a potion, and when he took this potion... It brought out another side. It brought out an evil side that was inside of him that was dying to get out. It was a movie, yeah. It was a movie. It was make-believe. <laughs> but that's what it was. And then I, I, I think back to what's the movie, Eddie, The Clumps? Is that the name of Eddie Murphy? Nutty Professor. Thank you, Nutty Professor. And what happened was Eddie Murphy was a professor, and he was real smart, and his name was Dr. Klump, what, Professor Klump or whatever it was. And what happened with him was he, he also made a, post, a, a, a potion like Dr. Jekyll did. And he made one, and, and this potion will bring out an uh, alter ego of Dr. or Professor Klump, and he called him Buddy Love. And what Buddy Love did was it was the opposite of, of the professor because the professor was obese. He was very big, and he didn't have the confidence in his side, in, inside of him. 
So what happened was, since he didn't have the confidence inside of him, he made this potion to bring somebody else out of him. Are you, are you, are you starting to follow what I'm getting at? It, I told you earlier that some people take a can of courage to bring out who, who they really want to sell. And what they say was, oh, it, I was drunk or something, and I, I didn't mean to say that. But they, it was already inside of them, and they really wanted to say it. But what happened was they had to have something to bring up the courage to help them to say uh, what they wanted to say all along. So Buddy Love and, and Professor Klump <laughs> would go back and forth. And, and it was a la- all over a lady. They wanted the love of a lady. And Buddy Love knew how to say the right things to get the ladies. And so Professor Klump, since he was obese and big, he didn't have the confidence to talk to her and say the things that he wanted to say. So he knew it was a battle going inside, so he decided to destroy all the the potions so that Buddy Love couldn't come in. Buddy Love had already planned for this thing to happen. So he hid one in Professor Klump's energy drinks or weight loss drinks or whatever the drink was. So he hid it in there, then he... uh, Buddy Love came back. And what happened was the school found out what it was going. So they was on stage and, and they was going through a award ceremony and back and forth and they start fighting. And this, what happened was he was fighting inside of himself. The war took, his, took, took form inside of his body. And that's what we deal with today, ladies and gentlemen. We, we fight with inside of ourselves. Some of us fight the confidence that, that, that we don't have it. And our mind plays tricks on us at one time. And we continue to go back and forth, back and forth. And the Bible says a man that's unstable in his ways. It talks about it. So we, we got to get stable and understand what God is saying. Let me get to some scripture. I just wanted to introduce you to what what we're talking about today. It was a long runway to get home what we needed to get to. So if you got your Bibles, you should already be there because Pastor Wendy brought it up already in Romans. We're not going to 15, but we're going to Romans chapter 7. Say this with me. The war war with inside us. And that's what we're dealing with. The war that's with inside of us. The the battle that's inside of us. It takes control of us at times. And it, it, it wins at times because we don't surrender ourselves over to the Lord. Now watch this, it says, verse number 14 for continuity. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am not. I am so human, sin rules me as if I were its slave. Isn't that interesting? So what happens is, you got all these people that want want to, to preach and teach about being under the law. And not really understanding what takes place. Because literally they put themselves back into sin. Because we can't have a hold us under the law. We don't have enough power to do the things that the law required us to do. And you don't want to be under the law anyway. It were great consequences from being under the law instead of grace. And verse number 15 says... I don't understand why I act the way I do. I don't do the good I want to do. And I do the evil I hate. Just in this first verse, you can see somebody that's all over. Just read the the second verse, I'm sorry. You you see somebody that's battling really against themselves. They want to do good, but evil is always present. I want to be right, but I, I can't be right because evil is always in my body. See, this is the back and forth, back and forth motion that they're going through because something is taking place and God is trying to get us somewhere. Verse number 16 says, And if I, do, if I don't 
want to do what I do, that means I agree that the law is good. And you really got to take your time reading the scripture because it'll make you seem like you're crazy trying to go back and forth and keep up with the words are saying. Verse 17. But I am not really the one doing the evil. It is sin living in me that does it. And listen, that scripture right there, that, those words right there tells us a lot about people that we see and meet today. Nobody want to take responsibility for what they do. Right. It's always somebody else's fault that, I, that I'm doing this or I do that. It was never my fault. You, you can easily go back to, to the beginning of the time in Adam. When Adam said, Lord, it's, it's that woman that you gave me. Instead of Adam saying, Lord, it was me that you instructed to pastor her, that you instructed to help her become the woman that you wanted her to be. It was my responsibility. So we, we've taken this from Adam from the beginning of time to make excuses for the things that we do, that we don't want to take fault in. It was always somebody else's fault. Let's look at verse 18. And it says, yes, I know that nothing good lives in me. I mean, nothing good lives in the part of me that is not spiritual. And if you have your Bibles, underline that part. That part, Because what's taking place is you got a cuckoo for cocoa for a person that's talking that's not spiritual. That's not understanding what God has intended for them. That's why they vasculate in their spirit. They One moment this way, one moment that way, one moment high, one moment late, low. But th what they want to call it is depression. And, and don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I understand that depression is real. But this is right here is telling you how to defeat depression. It's telling you how to be more than a conqueror over depression. And, and not, watch this, this is the key, ladies and gentlemen, not blame depression for everything. That you wanted to do anyway. Uh, am I helping us? Yeah. Let's go back to verse number 18. Was that? 18. Yes, I know that nothing good lives in me. I mean, nothing good lives in the part of me that is not spiritual. I want to do what is good, but I don't do it. And that's the key right there. It says, I don't do it. I don't do it. I want to do good, but I don't do it. See, if you understand Scripture, God says that I always give you a way of escape. God says, I give you a way out. I've given you an opportunity to do good. And it goes like this, a choice. Good and evil is always beside me. It's the mountain, the mountain of cursing and the mountain of blessing. Choose you today. Which one do you want to do? Who do you want to serve? What do you want to do? Ah, verse number 19. I don't do the good that I want to do. I do the evil that I don't want to do. So if I do what I don't want to do, then I am not really the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. Is that, does it sound like an excuse again, ladies and gentlemen? If you're listening to this scripture, I want to do good, and good is always before me, but I don't do it because it's the sin that's making me, that, li that lives inside of me. Okay, let's look at it this way. Let me, let me put, put a, a little twist on this. You own property, and, and you rent in your property to somebody that's tearing up your property. Do you let them tear that property down to the ground, or do you get them evicted? <laughs> that, may, that should make you say, hmm. So why do you let sin live inside of you that's tearing you down? That's tearing down the property that's inside. Why don't you evict the sin that's inside of you? And then one of the things that I, I really don't understand right here, I, I really don't understand. Eternal life is free. It's free. 
But listen to this. It says the wages. The wa- what, what is wages? Come on, talk back to me, Sunday. The cost. The cost. Sin costs you. Why do we want to pay to go to hell? It's just a thought. Why, why do we want to give our money, our hard, hard on, hard on money to sin? The wages of sin. The cost of sin. The payment of sin. Just me. I just, I don't know. Verse number 20. So if I do what I do, let me go. So if I do what I don't want to do, then I am not really the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. 21. So I have learned this rule. When I want to do good, evil is there with me. In my mind, I am happy with God's law. Verse 23. But I see another law working in my body. That law makes war against the law that my mind accepts. That outward law working in my body is the law of sin. And that law makes me its prisoner. Verse 24. What a miserable person I am. And I, I could tell you something. That, that verse right there, those particular words right there, is now what I call accountability. If you see the wrong that's inside of you and you start to make a decision and a choice, you are now account, being accountable to yourself to decide that I don't want to live that way anymore. I'm tired of living in sin. I'm, I'm tired of not walking by faith. Yeah, I want to make a difference in my life. I want to make a change in, in my life. And this is what this, just those verses right there, just that, those few words highlighted to me. Let's look at it again. What a miserable person I am. And he's talking bad about himself, but I got good out of that. Because he knows the quality that's inside of himself right now. And he's saying that I don't want to be that no more. I got to make a change in my life. A change has to come. The Bible said it's just simple. Choose you today. It's that simple. You make the choice. I, I'm telling you, I can't, I can't choose who you serve. I can only lay out the foundational, foundational pieces that God gives me to give to you. And even when the foundational pieces come, it's still your choice. That's why it says, you choose today. Not Pastor Campbell, not Pastor Wendy. You got to choose. And watch how you can be more than a conqueror. Choose you today. Go back to verse 24 again. What a miserable person I am. Who will save me from this body that brings me death? I thank God for his salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So in my mind, I am a slave to God's law. But in my simple self, I am a slave to the law of sin. Back and forth. Back and forth. The war that's inside of you goes back and forth. But you have to make a conscious decision of what you want to do or how do you want your life. Has anybody in here ever felt they had a struggle in their life that they, they just couldn't get the victory out of? That, that I couldn't win. That, that I'm already defeated. But let me give you a, a U-turn on that. You know, when, when your GPS says recalculating, let's recalculate something in your spirit right now. The word says 
that you are more than a conqueror. So if you're more than a conqueror, how can you be defeated? A choice. Your defeat only comes by you choosing to be defeated. What we've been saying for almost the whole, this half a year now, that if you don't understand nothing I say, just remember this, that in the end that you win. But I have to put the qualifier on it, ladies and gentlemen. You only win if you decide to win. That's right. it, it, once again, it's your choice. See, the struggle is because you know what you're supposed to do, but you don't do it. The struggle is you know what to do, but you don't do it. Anything for you, beautiful. But see, that's the struggle. You struggle with inside of yourself because your body is saying that the spirit that God has placed inside of you, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit that's inside of you is saying, do right. But your body says, do wrong. And can I just tell you the problem, the issue here is that your body is speaking louder because you feed your body more than you feed your spirit. What are you saying, Pastor? What, what, what do you mean feed? When was the last time you picked up your Bible before you walked into the church? When was the last time that you pushed away from the table and started fasting? When is the last time that you bent those knees and start praying to God? And you don't have to just bend your knees to pray. When, just, when was the last time you prayed to God? And when was the last time you literally meant not my will, but your will be done. And see, in heaven as it is in earth, I mean on earth as it is in heaven, do you understand what you just released right there? But we can't do this if we don't understand the will of God for our lives. What's the, and you know, I'm not saying that you don't understand your purpose. I'm talking about the will of God for your life. The will is to do good. So if you battle, why can't you pull it off to be a victor? And I've told you, PG-13, that you already beat a million swimmers before you set your foot on the earth. You done beat a million before you set your feet on earth. Tell me that you're not a conqueror. But as soon as you set your feet on firm foundation, now you want to become a loser. I'm not calling anybody a loser. But what I'm saying is that the, the winning mentality was already placed in your DNA. Say that again, secondhand preacher. It was already in you before they placed you in your mother's womb. Amen. Am I helping us today? Amen. See, the, the problem is we just can't get to somewhere without knowing what we're supposed to do. Your body already tells, your spirit is already telling you what you're supposed to do. I, I, I guess the issue that we have sometimes is where does our faith lie? Where is the faith? And I guess we might have to expound on more faith, Pastor Wendy. We have to go back and bring up some teaching on faith. Two personalities that dwells inside of one body. It sounds like twins to me, but that's in one body. One body. Let's look at, talk about a little bit of chapter 7 of, of Acts. Corporate punishment. Capital punishment. And anybody that knows of two personalities that dwells inside of one, it's going to be Paul. 
At, the t- at that time, it was Saul. Saul, rather, knows about having two personalities. It, Saul started out, he wanted to kill every Christian. He wanted to wipe you out. Then he had that miraculous encounter on the road of Damascus. And his personality changed. Paul, uh, Paul was so bad that he, he was a witness or he was, he was actually helping to kill Stephen. He held the coats of those that was breaking Stephen. So he was a witness. He, he was a cohort in the, in the attack against one of God's men. He was holding their coats and, and, and saying, basically saying, get them. Nowadays, you don't hold the coat. You hold your cell phone and, and film it while somebody is attacking somebody else. Part of the crime, an accessory after the fact or during the fact and don't even realize it. But Stephen has a testimony that he will not back down from. His life was placed in, in, in question and he didn't back down. The testimony is that Jesus is the Son of God. His te- he stood on that testimony Brother James, he, he, he said, I can't waver. I can't go back and forth in my mind. It's one, it's this way. And I have to stand on it. They captured him and he didn't change his mind. Can I ask you a question, a rhetorical question? If your life is placed in harm, and they told you you have to choose to free yourself to denounce Jesus Christ. What's your testimony? What's your testimony? And even as they threw rocks, this is Stephen's testimony in, in, the, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 60. He says to them, he says, he looks up to heaven and he, before he dies, he says these words, Father, do not hold this charge to them. Somebody's attacking you. Can, can, can you literally say, Father, do not hold this charge against them? He was set in his mind. He wasn't going to change his mind because somebody attacked him. He for God I live and for God I die is what he stand on. And that, that's a similar scripture to what Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, when Jesus said, Jesus, uh, he was on Calvary, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not. So Stephen, it was similar to what Jesus was talking about. And in Acts 7 and 55, it says that in the Bible, it says Stephen was, he looked up to heaven steadfast. And before he released his spirit, he sees Jesus on the right hand of God, standing up. Y'all need to stay with me right here. He's seeing Jesus stand up. If you can get Jesus to stand up from his seat, from the right hand of the Father, you have accomplished something. Jesus just doesn't get out of his seat for anything. Jesus gets out of the seat for you, your faithfulness, your faith in him, your ability to stand fast in him. Don't waver, don't change, don't denounce him. After witnessing this stuff, Saul had a a moment. Saul went to the king and asked the king to give him a letter. 
He went to him in Acts chapter 9, verse 2. He said, give me a letter. Because in this letter, I want you to allow me to go to Damascus. I want you to allow me to go so I can kill off the Christians. I need to be released for this. I need your authority to let me go kill them. And you know that story. If you need the story, look at Acts chapter 9, verses 1, 1 through 11. or one, Yeah, 1 through 19. And that will be the story of Saul's Damascus Road encounter. And one of the things about it, watch what's happened. He got blinded. And then when he got blinded, he couldn't walk, so he had to crawl because he, did, he couldn't get nowhere because he couldn't see. So he's, he's led to a man that's called Anil, Anilus. Anil, Sapphira, Ananias. Ananias. Uh, Ananias. <laughs> I couldn't see. An, Ananias. He was led to him. And Ananias was afraid because he heard what Paul or Saul was doing. And Ananias was a, a Christian, a man of faith. And he had to give him a word. And this, his name was actually a common name during that time, but what this, his name literally means Yahweh has been gracious. God has been gracious. So my question to you, has God been gracious to any of you? Amen. And, and I, I'm not asking you to look for the big things that you think that you're supposed to have, but I'm looking at just waking up is a gracious thing for some of us. Y'all have to come to Bible study and ask that question, what do you mean for some of us, Pastor? You have to come to Bible study tomorrow and I'll give you that answer. So, Ananias holds Saul's hand and begins to pray for him. Somebody that he was afraid of. Somebody that tortured other Christians like him. And watch this. This is the key point. After the prayer, after the Spirit fell on Saul, God changed his name. See, and this is what needs to take place in some of our lives. We need a name change. We need identity change. So Saul became Paul now because he had an encounter with God. He no longer persecuted. He's now a preacher of the gospel of Christ. He goes away for three years. Then when he comes back, he's a missionary. He's on mission for God. He's trying to undo the bad that he's done. And I had to get to that point. No matter how bad you've done in your past, no matter what you've done, God has given you an opportunity to change your name so you can change the circumstances, so you can change your identity and become that new creature in Christ. He's given it to you. And you too can write a letter to the people and, and be a witness. I knew a pastor that always said, can I get a witness? See, God is looking for witnesses to help win the souls of unbelievers. Let's look at, I want to tell you about chapter 7 of Romans. Paul literally put his laundry out there. He told everything that he did. He didn't, un he didn't hide nothing. He uncovered every wrong that he did. And I'm telling you that because like us today, when we do something, we try to hide until, instead of tell it all. And I'm not telling you to go out and tell on yourself, but what I'm saying is when this time is right and God has told you to tell it, don't hide it. Release it. And it's releasing you from a place where you need 
to be released from. It's giving you opportunity to do something else. Paul puts himself on blast. It's not like them that's running for office now, somebody go out and find the dirt on them. And they put them on blast. Paul said, you're not going to find any dirt on me because I'm releasing it now. He said, there's no residue that's going to be left inside of me. I'm getting rid of all the junk so I can be free to do the things that the Lord has me to do. I'm not hiding. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ is what he's saying. Paul writes and tells them that, we have to, that we're justified by faith. And he's saying, this is what he's saying. Listen, Paul says that you move from faith to faith. Let that sink in. And in the same book, same writer, Paul also tells us that, that we're not only justified, but we are glorified. In his book, he also tells us that we shall continue in sin if we don't get rid of it. Paul says that, we, that where sin did abound, grace did much more than abound. Look, why would you want to keep yourself in sin if grace abound much more than sin? In this book, Paul writes and tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Paul continues to tell us in this book that if you continue to, to move in the right direction, that God is free to open up the windows of heaven for you, to bless you. I'm sorry, the doors we're now in the New Testament. The windows are in the Old Testament. You, you are able to receive the doors open. And he says in chapter 1 of, of, of the same book that I told you earlier, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God until salvation. To your salvation, to my salvation. In his book, Paul tells us how shall we come how shall we call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? How shall we call upon the name? In this book, Paul tells us that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his power. And let me tell you something. Paul knows something that we overlook, and he wants to tell us, and he tells us to go to book of Acts chapter 7, I mean Romans chapter 7, verse 14. He said, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am sub, uh, unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And Paul is telling us three things in my clothing. He said, number one, knowledge of the rules is not the answer. Just having knowledge of the rules, just having knowledge of it, is not the answer. That would be found in Romans chapter 7, verse 9. Paul was fine as long as he did not understand that the law, the, what the law demanded. Hmm. Where did he learn the truth? Where did the truth come to Paul? on his Damascus Road encounter. He learned it on that, that moment where he could have to depend on nothing but God. He couldn't see. He needed the, 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 the faith to be able to go. And this is where the scripture really puts it into our mind, walk by faith and not by sight. He had to be faithful in the thing that God was saying to him on this encounter. Number two, self-determination. To make it plain. You got you to gotta make this thing plain. What happens is, you know, I had a conversation with my daughter, and, and she was taking a test, and she asked me some questions. The thing was she was overlooking, and she was making what the test was harder than what it was supposed to be. 
It was so simple. But she looked and made it confusing because she was making it hard in her mind. But the thing is, self-determination to make it plain. The struggling in one's own strength doesn't bring on success. So watch this. Uh, uh, the struggle comes when you make this thing harder than what it ever supposed to be. And if you need some help to understand that, you go to Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Paul found himself sinning in ways that weren't even attractive to himself. Man, that's some hard sin, ladies and gentlemen. When this, <laughs> and I told you that. I felt that experience for two years. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. I, I thought I was jacked up. To myself. Number three. Becoming a Christian does not stop, uh, stamp out all sin and temptation from one's own personal life. Just because you said I become a Christian and, and doesn't mean that you're exempt for anything else that happens. And if you need an understanding of that, you go to Romans uh, chapter 7, verse 22 to 25. Can I tell you, being born again takes a moment of faith. But becoming like Christ is a lifetime process. A moment of faith versus a lifetime process. Paul co compares Christian growth to a hard light. Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who completes in the game goes into a strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Verse 26, therefore I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, verse 27, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Eh, do you understand this thing is literally talking to some preachers? Too. Eh, some preachers get up here and preach this word and disqualify themselves because of the manner that they bring the word the manner that they're not being faithful to the word. And to cap that off, it says in 2 Timothy verse four and verse seven, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So all the things that you do, all things that, that you accomplish, you have to keep the faith. The bottom line is, Paul is saying to us, the problem that he faced was himself. Can you be honest with yourself and, and when you look in the mirror and say, the problems that I face, it was me. I was the issue. We make a joke about this. We talk about a lady that's been married seven times and, 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 and that's divorced now. And then they, they want to blame all the issues on all the men, but it was only one common denominator out of all the seven marriages. It was her. She never faced up to her problems. Wanted to blame everybody else but her self. But people in this world don't realize it, and they don't see it the way that God sees it. And God wants you to look at yourself as he sees you. And I'm going to tell you right now, God says that you were beautifully and wonderfully made in his image or our images. What he's saying is you was made in the image of him, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. What, what that literally is telling you is that you're so much more than what you ever can think or imagine yourself to be. Can you, do you, am I helping us? Can I tell you this? It's not the enemy that's on the 
outside of you, but it's the enemy that's on the inside of you. See, the problem is we have to stop talking about sin, but start seeing sin like God sees it. And then we won't make any excuses when we see sin how God sees it. Give God some glory in here. Come on, give God some glory. Did I help us today? I'll turn this part of the service over to Pastor Wendy.